you some of my own background here. Uh, this is going to be the bad part. I feel like I'm bragging to some degree. I'm trying not to, but to give some uh, context. Uh, I've been doing public speaking uh, since middle school. Uh, I uh, competed in Richmond, Indiana, doing discussion. Uh, I was a four-time state competitor when I did compete uh, in discussion uh, once I got to high school. Uh, I've given TED Talks. Uh, if you uh, do go online, type in my name, you'll find a TED Talk about um, gifted, talented students uh, in Indiana. Uh, I'm a huge TED fan. If you don't know what TED Talks are, man, get the party started. I mean, go to TED.com. You're going to learn some great stuff. Um, I've also been the coach for two years for TEDx Fort Wayne. Um, I'll coach our local TEDx speakers. And the reason I bring that up is because people see TEDx speakers or any public speakers in general as these professionals. Uh, when I gave my own TED Talk, uh, when I got to meet the other uh, people giving the speeches, we were all mortified. The moment the directors left, we all pulled out our notes and started cribbing again. We're just like high school students. Uh, and even in my coaching of TEDx speakers, it's the same way. Uh, regardless of age, experience, and talent, I would dare say that all speakers are a little nervous, and we all need that prep to go into it. And I think that's why oratory is so important. And what I'm going to offer you is my own background. In, in public speaking and just some tips I can offer you. There are lots of ways to approach public speaking, but these are the tips I'm giving you. Um, we're here specifically to talk about the event of original oratory, also known as OO. This event is probably the purest public speaking event. If you're gonna have a speech meet, this really is the creme de la creme. This is true public speaking. You write your own speech, you memorize it, you deliver it. Not much more beyond that. Uh, what I'm going to give you today can also be employed in informative speaking, which is essentially oratory, except you have props. And instead of giving a general idea, you're presenting on a solid fact that you want to give more information about. So in regards to oratory, you're trying to move your audience toward action. Informative, you're trying to teach them. Although I think a good oratory will teach you, and a good informative will move you to action. So. Uh, again, I told you I'm a TED nerd. Uh, this book, Talk Like TED, I read about five or six years ago. I'm a huge fan of it, and I love the approach it took to public speaking. Essentially, a manual on how to give your own TED talk, it breaks down speaking into nine rules. That can be found in the handout I've provided you as well. But I'm also going to walk through all of them here. Uh, my slides will cover these nine rules essentially a great path on how to write and then deliver your own speech. Step one, when you have a student that wants to do OO, I always say, find something you're passionate about. Uh, if you give something you're not passionate about, I don't think the speech can be as effective. Some coaches will say, you're giving a speech on this because it's timely, it's gonna be a great topic, people will love it. If the kid doesn't love it, they burn out midway through the season, and you don't have anyone to give that great speech. You have to let the kids have some autonomy and you can guide them along the way. Uh, for instance, last year for informative, I had a girl walk up to me. She loved her topic. She's like, I'm gonna give an informative speech. I'm like, Kaylee, that's amazing. What's it gonna be about? Platypuses. You're not going to be the sectional champion with a speech on platypuses. Maybe not she necessarily. could. <laughs> I know, I was getting ready to say, it's possible. I've seen some really good speeches on just something like pineapples. But I talked yeah. to her a little bit more, and I said, well, why? And she said, well, I think they're so cute. I'm like, well, what else do you like? She's like, I love fashion. She eventually came up with a speech about enclosed cognition, the psychology of why we wear the clothes we wear. It was a much deeper speech. It was uh, certainly one that had a lot of research. By the end of the day, she qualified for state for the first time in informative uh, at sectionals. And was on a great run, would have done very well at state had, you know, the world not collapsed later on. So uh, yeah. I, I do really feel that if you're going to give an OO, I would advise you let your students pick something they're passionate about. The reason for that is laid out here. I think research becomes so much easier if you're excited to do the research. Uh, when you talk about how to write an OO, I oftentimes will help the kid produce an outline. And then I divorce myself in the process. I let the kid write everything. Uh, then after that, maybe I'll come in and I'll suggest some edits. Uh, maybe I'll give them like a, a fact or two or a quote to help you know, move it along. But let them do the research because that ownership makes it a better speech. Um, usually our seasons are a long season. Uh, so if they pick out their topic in August, 
by the time state rolls around in March, they need to still be interested in what they're speaking about. Being passionate about your topic to begin with allows for that sustained interest. And then finally, of course, you're going to have a great message at the end of the year if they truly care about what's going on. I'm really hoping you guys recognize these two. Uh, I, I've been giving this example for some time, uh, and with each passing year, when I talk to students about this, uh, fewer and fewer people remember Prince. They always know Michael Jackson, but they, fewer and fewer are recognizing Prince now, which which crushes me because mm -hmm. honestly, I'm more of a Prince guy than a Michael Jackson guy myself. But I, that I'm not gonna, you know, make you guys uh, pick one or the other. Prince. <laughs> Mitch knows what's going on. Thank you. Thank you. I've given so many critical examples from Prince's lyrics. I, I cannot even begin. But uh, when you look at the two, um, it, it's two different styles. Very popular artists. Prince's lyrics were superb. And, and he would brag about them. And in fact, what many people don't know, Prince had a great disdain for Michael Jackson. Because Prince had uh, lyrics that were incredible. Prince was a poet. He was before his time in so many ways. Michael Jackson's lyrics were, I, I don't want to use the word simple, so I'm not going to say anymore. But Michael Jackson's lyrics were easy to understand. And his music was amazing. Uh, the beat, the rhythm. And when you compare the two, Michael Jackson is by far the better selling artist. Even today, my students recognize Michael Jackson as Prince's memory begins to fade, sadly. The reason I bring this up is that it's not about the words your students write sometimes. And in fact, I'd say most of the time. It's the emotion they bring to their oration, to their speech, that makes the big difference. And I say this across most of the events that we coach. Uh, while Prince's lyrics were amazing, Michael Jackson's were more memorable. Um, I've used this example to talk about politics. Um, if you look at the 2016 election, I would dare say Hillary's orations were stronger. The point she made made more sense. But Donald Trump knew how to get into the feelings of his audience. At some point, you could probably mute the screen and it wouldn't matter. Trump's way of getting himself into the good graces of his audience was not about the words he was saying, but the emotions he was conveying. Now, that's just two examples, but I need to continue to go on that when you give a speech, it's not just about the good writing. I can help you with that, too. I can tell a kid how to use better words. We can get the thesaurus out. We can make this kid sound like a professor. But the ease of understanding a topic is what's going to get the one. If a judge is moved by the speech, it's not necessarily going to be the words the kid is using, but the feelings that that kid is cultivating. And the best way to accomplish this in any speech is by storytelling. And here's why I believe that. Storytelling is a tradition dating back even to ancient Samaria. Uh, we look at our ability to tell stories as a way to express what we're feeling. Uh, this can go back to even Gilgamesh, the idea of, you know, so many feelings, you know, uh, his, I don't, I'm going to go back to ancient literature, but even uh, male friendships and relationships with uh, Gilgamesh and Enkidu. It's that idea that telling a story conveys so much more than simply telling facts. Facts are good. Storytelling is more effective. How do we make our students better storytellers? When a student says they want to do OO, one of the first questions I ask them is, how much do you read? Uh, they're kind of taken aback, but most kids read whether they know it or not. If they're reading um, articles on ESPN, awesome. If they're reading articles from the Daily Mail, they're still reading something. I'm saying, okay, so you're reading things. What makes a story interesting when you read it? And they'll, they'll share that with me. I'll say, do that in your speech then. Find a way to make what you're saying entertaining to your audience. Which brings me to the next thing. When you tell a good story, it needs to be captivating. Learning to tell a story is essentially telling an anecdote in your speech. Now, I'm not saying your entire speech has to be anecdotes, but they need to be mixed in. Because you can tell facts all day, but we somehow in human nature, we relate so much more to a story. Stories allow us to clarify our point and then move on to inspire. We can also bury our points in those stories and convince our audience before they even know it. And I'll talk more about how humor can accomplish that as well. One story I often use, and this is just one example of how a story, a genuine story, this actually happened to me in Dayton, Ohio, can convey a point. I'll be quick about this. 
I'm in sixth grade, a very awkward time in most people's lives, especially in America. Middle school is not exactly a happy place for many of our young people. I was in a hotel in Dayton, Ohio. My parents had to go to this auction. They were very much into buying Indian artifacts. There was an auction in the lobby or in the um, major convention center of this hotel. I was left to my own devices. So being a high school or a middle schooler, I wanted nothing to do with my parents. I went to the weight room, worked out for a little while. After which, being all sweaty and nasty, I went back to the room and I started watching The X-Files. Now, this is the 90s. That was a very popular show at the time. I hope people still know, know the reference. Mm -hmm. So after watching The X-Files for about 15 minutes, I'm sweaty, I'm nasty, I'm getting ready to get a shower. So I go to get my, my, my stuff for my shower, my clothes. And that's when it hits me. I can't find my clothes. I see the luggage is not my parents' luggage. <laughs> I've entered the wrong hotel room. <laughs> it's the 90s key card technology was not exactly perfect at that point and apparently my key card had gotten me into someone else's room at this point i typically ask my audiences what would you do in this situation now we can't do this in oratory i wish we had that interaction in oratory but i'm going to ask my audience right now what would you do in this situation panic and get out <laughs> yeah just leave as quickly as possible yeah I've actually had the fun. That, that's that's what I did by by the spoiler alert. Now, um, the first thing people say is like, well, you don't want to panic. You don't make sure you didn't leave anything. You know, like what if you like left your key card in there and you know, like your car keys or something, you know, or wallet. The uh, so I'm like one kid. My favorite answer I got when I did this, as he said, hide under the bed. I'm like the hell. What are you doing? Hide under the bed. And he says, well, if someone sees you trying to leave the room, you know, they might call the police. Hide under the bed until the people get back, and when they're asleep, you can sneak out. You can learn a lot no. about someone by telling this story. <laughs> uh, I got out. Didn't I told my it, parents what happened. I was off by like two, two rooms. Um, but I did get back to my original, and I told my parents, like, oh, huh. They they believe me, but did nothing. Um, but the reason I tell this story, and depending on the on the context of when I tell the story, you can use this story to convey multiple points. And this is the three that I bring up here: vigilance. I told this story to my freshmen at times to say, make sure you pay attention to your surroundings. It can help you out in difficult circumstances. Had I been more vigilant early on, knowing my room number, recognizing the luggage earlier on, I could have saved myself the panic I initially felt fifteen minutes later. I also talk about having grace under pressure. I, I talked to some athletes about this as well. You will be faced with unexpected um, circumstances that will challenge you. You have two choices. You can be the person that understands you need to walk calmly out of the room and leave the bad situation. You can also talk about how if you are panicked and you hide under that bed like that kid I told you about, you could find yourself in a much worse situation later that evening. I've even used to talk about complacency. If you opt to do nothing in a situation, that can often be the worst situation. Had I opted not to do anything, see it was a bad situation and just panicked and stayed there until someone arrived, it could have been a terrible circumstance. Mm -hmm. This is just one example how, and if I had more time, I've given this speech in an hour long session and I go through three stories like this, but mm -hmm. any story you have when applied the right way can be powerful and entertaining. And I would encourage you to have your students think about stories they've gone through in life. And if you know the student well, be like, what's the most embarrassing thing that's ever happened to you? If they can weaponize that into a good story, you can put that into many OOs, informatives, even debates, impromptu speaking. Um, extempers do it all the time as their attention getter. That helps you powerfully to move that kid into speaking and they have complete ownership of their own story. So I, I love that aspect of public speaking. We have to get into some of the technical stuff. When I coach OO, uh, the kid often asks, when I write my speech, how long should it be? And, I'll, and I say, look, it's an eight to 10 minute speech. I don't want you speaking more than 170 words per minute. I, I've looked at studies. Anything more than 170 words per minute is too fast for an audience to pay attention to. I know I'm feeling rushed right now, and I'm speaking more quickly than I typically would during an oration. Uh, but when doing public speaking, 170 words per minute. You figure out how long you want your speech to be, you do the math at that point. So at this point, I tell my kid, 1,700 uh, words, aim for that, and we'll see where we go from there. 
uh, because typically a kid will write a speech and then they'll want to fit it into the 10 minutes. So they start speaking like this really quickly or they stumble over their words. So by all means, make sure it's 1700 to start and then adjust from there as needed. Uh, volume is always crucial. You don't want to have a kid shouting at their audience, but certainly they need to raise their voice enough so the people in the back of the room can be heard. This will be happening in your practice sessions. Make sure that they're audible. In these times where many things may be virtual, make sure that when you do practices that they're audible through their microphones. Um, when it comes to pitch, the main thing I tell my kids is to you know be, have a variety of tones. You don't want to be monotone and have so you lose someone. I've always liked the idea of punching keywords. If there's something you want to make sure your audience knows, go through your words, punch keywords, highlight the words you want to hit hard and let those words resonate. And I'm also a big fan of pauses. When I talk about that 1700 words, that's taking into account that sometimes you're just going to say a story and let it linger with your audience. A good pause not only draws attention to the point you're trying to make, but it shows confidence that you don't need to constantly talk and have control of the situation. You're confident enough in what you're doing that you can stop, look at your audience, and continue with your oration. And then when it comes to gestures, uh, I think that has to be up to the kid how comfortable they feel. I had one kid that I felt like he was always shaking his hands like this. I like variety in gestures, but I don't want them being overwhelming either. It's something to keep an eye on, but not to overdo either. When it comes to informative and OO, and I think this is especially true for both of those, but even extemp and impromptu, novelty is crucial. The body has a reaction when it learns something new. It produces dopamine. Literally, the same type of chemicals that we get when addicted to anything, whether it be gambling or other vices, that dopamine release is crucial in a good speech. The more novelty you can add to a speech, the better it will be received by your audience. And this can be accomplished through a number of things. I've always been a big fan of my teaching strategy when I teach in school to have facts to drop along the way that are not related to my, my source material. I'm a Latin teacher. Yes, I teach a lot of grammar and vocab, but I'll drop social studies knowledge. I'll drop pop culture knowledge, uh, historical knowledge outside of Rome and, and, and the ancient world. Kids eat up that new information, even if it's not about my source material. If kids feel like they're learning something new and fun, they're definitely going to want to pay attention. That's why Snapple puts those little facts underneath their cap all the time. We love new information. I would even say that could be done in the delivery as well. Find a variety of ways to deliver your speech. Don't just stand there. Take different spots. There's something called the extemp walk, if you haven't heard yet. You start in the middle. You walk off to one side, then the other, then the other. Awesome. That's great. But I like the idea of finding novel ways to stand and approach your audience. Change levels. Get down to their level. Stand up. Arch your back. Find different ways to present to your audience that, again, adds novelty. It makes people pay attention and enjoy it more. I'll talk about perspective as well. A good OO presents a perspective that your audience has never considered. Uh, one of our OOs last year that made it to state was uh, a young girl. Uh, she, um, freshman girl. A student of color, and um, one of my, uh, we were considering, okay, you want to do an OO, I, I think the easy thing to do would be like, okay, well, let's talk about some of the social justice. I hesitate to do that. I want to actually go back to my passion topic once again. Don't give them the topic they're going to give. Let them pick what they want to talk about. This girl wanted nothing to do with social justice. She loved video games. I'm like, okay, I'm going to meet you where you are. That is a perspective that, that I, I mean, a lot of people may want to see. What is your spin on video games going to be? We talked it out. We considered maybe doing violence in video games. She wasn't really a big fan of that. But she said as a female gamer, she's dealt with a lot of bullying uh, on the online uh, gaming uh, systems. Her speech ended up being um, women in gaming, a perspective that very few people have considered. Uh, number one, gamers in general have their own subculture. Women are often overlooked in that subculture, and she had a great speech. We researched it a lot, found all sorts of new perspectives you've never seen. Presenting a new perspective is a great way to add novelty and to give some gravitas to your speech, making it that more important. I think a showstopper, by the way, I can't see my clock. How am I doing on time? About five till 10. 
Perfect. I'm going to skip my story here quickly. Um, all I'm going to say is this. Um, I feel like speeches need to have a showstopper at some point. Midway through your speech, and it doesn't have to necessarily be in the middle. It could be toward the end. You want to have something where you can just drop the mic and be like, this is my huge point. Uh, it can be a statistic. It can be a story that just drives home your point. Uh, it can be a story about misdirection where you make people comfortably think it's one thing and then move on to something else. A great show-stopping moment within a speech is that memorable moment. And, and this goes again back to the, the way we do things. Um, I want to ask you guys, do you know what you were doing on September 10th? Being a teenager. I, most people don't know what they were doing on September 10th because there's no emotional connection to that day. I feel though, if I were to ask, what were you doing on September 11th of 2001? Many of you would know exactly where you were and what was going on because of that emotional connection. A good show-stopping moment is an emotional charged event. And look that up online. You'll get some great ideas on emotionally charged events. That is what's going to make your speech memorable. That's the moment that you want to highlight in your speech. It's like, look, when your judge you know, leaves church on Sunday or goes back to class on Monday with their job on Monday, this is the thing that we want them to remember. They're not going to memorize your entire speech, but we're going to pick out that show-stopping moment in your speech to highlight that that's what's going to stick with them for the next week or so, if not the rest of their lives. And we highlight that, we build the speech around that and make that work. If you have a strong show-stopping moment, it makes your speech effective and memorable. And when that judge is writing down their scores, if you're the first speaker, and maybe after they've seen five of the five other speakers, that show-stopping moment will help you stand out when you need it most. Uh, this is my story. Sorry, you're not gonna get that for time's sake. Uh, but I do wanna uh, go into humor. Humor is divisive. Uh, many coaches will say, have as many jokes in your info or your OO as possible. I hesitate to do that. Unless someone is a professional comedian, Jokes can be dangerous. Uh, I often, we will not rely on jokes unless they're typically incredibly bad puns that are deliberately delivered poorly to be the joke itself as a type of self-deprecation. Um, they shouldn't be forced. I think you can be humorous in a speech without telling a joke. You know, you can share a story. That anecdote I shared about the hotel as an example of how to, you know, dip your toe into some humor without trying to be a comedian. Uh, it also takes away from the gravitas of your speech. If you're constantly trying to make somebody laugh, you need to have those serious moments. There should be humor, but it should take the form of stories, light self-deprecation, observational humor to create a shared experience among your audience and yourself. And also when you attempt light humor, you make yourself vulnerable to a degree that endears you to your audience. But if you're trying too hard to make your audience laugh, it comes off as desperate and can really turn your audience off to your presentation. I see that happen in info a lot where all oh. these one liners are being thrown in and it's just like, dude, just tell me about your subject. I mean, because yeah, you could tell it's thrown in to be thrown in, you know, and it, it, it a lot of times it can erode the effectiveness of the of the of the info. Totally agree. I'm glad you guys see that too, because I might, and sometimes my kids have a, tr a trouble sometimes seeing that because they want to be the star on the stage, you know, telling the jokes. I'm like, if you want to be a star, have a good speech. Mm -hmm. Yeah, That's what's going to yeah. get it done. Mm -hmm. um, if you haven't heard of the rule of three, uh, this is crucial. Three is a natural number of completion. And I can go through the list historically um, of how three is a number of completion. I'll save us time in the history lesson, but a rule of three often shows completion. Uh, it allows your judge to recall exactly what you've talked about, and you can have three major topics you talk about, and within each topic, three subtopics, just like writing that three-paragraph essay in high school. Um, it helps to support the major idea mm -hmm. and lifts things up, and we can go even deeper. If I had more time, I would go more deeply at how those three support one another. You know, you can have um, one where you um, identify the problem. Um, then you identify the effects of the problem and then you identify the solution. That's one method on doing a three, a rule of three. 
Um, the reason I like it more than anything for young speakers is it forces them not to repeat themselves. It forces them to follow an outline when writing their speech and not just, you know, go, going off into the ether with all the things they want to say. It forces organization. And when I typically start a speech off with somebody, I will write the outline for them. I have no problem doing that. And there are different takes on the rules on who writes what for OOs and original uh, written pieces. But typically once a kid will give me a topic, I'll pick five or six subtopics. I'm like, okay. We're going to pick three out of these now, uh, and we'll pick those three, and I'll usually order them for them at that point, Those uh, that outline, and then I'm like, all right, write this speech. And when they write that speech, that's when they start to put their own touch on things, their own spin on things. That's how our great OOs have been written. Okay, uh, I know I'm wrapping up on time here. I'll be very quick. I love the idea of modeling in public speaking. Uh, if you want to have a good speaker, they have to have their own models to follow. Um, I'll say this. Um, as a teacher, uh, my first two, three years, I modeled other teachers for my life. Um, I was not going out of the textbook on teaching. I was emulating the great teachers I'd had in my past. Uh, if you want to be a good speaker, you have to watch other good speakers. And I tell my kids that all the time. You know what? Instead of writing your speech tonight, I want you to watch about 20 minutes worth of TED Talks. Or instead of writing your speech tonight, I want you to go online and find some commencement addresses and see what was effective. Find good speeches. Sometimes I'll, I'll pull them from, um, oh, don't tell other people this. If you know Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, sometimes mm -hmm. I'll be like, look, you want to give a good speech? Watch Kevin Spacey here. Yeah, um, no, no, not Kevin Spacey. Yeah. Who is it? Um, Baldwin. Baldwin. Yeah, Baldwin. Uh, watch Alec Baldwin here. Um, he will just show you how to just tear apart an audience and have them in the 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 you know palm of your hand. Now, don't go using all those words again. There's a lot of swearing in Glengarry Glen Ross, but find good speeches. Mm -hmm. It allows for discovery. And I'm not saying you should steal what they have, but you can discover different ways to present your material. It inspires you. It's like, man, I want to be like that one day. And you start doing the little things to become a great speaker. And you begin to assimilate the good stuff. Here are the three that I've emulated over my life. You're looking at Sir Ken Robinson. He's given what is probably the most successful TED Talk in history. Um, over 20 million views. Um, he's a teacher. Um, I love his style, his performance. I've emulated a lot of what he's done in my own style. This gentleman, any idea? Jimmy. Yep, that is Jimmy Stewart. Um, I find that when I'm more in social settings, I will emulate his social awkwardness that, well, mm, I, I, that to avoid coming off is as arrogant or proud. I often go into my Jimmy Stewart mode, that kind of like fumbling, but still charming way. It's a great way to work on interpersonal skill. I have my kids watch all sorts of old movies, um, you know, just clips, not the whole thing, but find a speaking style that speaks to you. And then this is just for me. Don't make fun of me. This next one is my favorite speaker, probably the greatest speaker that I think in the history of time. In the late 90s, he would cut promos that I felt moved me toward public speaking. That is Dwayne The Rock Johnson. <laughs> he is, I'm telling you, go on YouTube. When he was in the WWF in the late 90s, the promos he would cut made me want to be the greatest speaker of all time, just the way he speaks. And I think that's been proven now. He's made his way out of pro wrestling into the mainstream. The man knows how to speak, to build up all sorts of emotions, whether that be hate, and pro wrestling's great about that. But no, to make to, to be loath, to be hated, to be in inspiring to, to be funny i still have my kids watch some of his promos just to learn how to deliver a speech sometimes the sources are limitless find those good speakers you love find the good speakers your kids love and you'll find all sorts of ways to create great styles of public speaking a uh, last one as a team i really do feel like you need to go outside of speech to actually find good examples um, this is a picture of my team at the tedx event at purdue we planned a field trip just to watch other speakers. Uh, on the bus, we started judging them on the way back. Who got the one? Who got the two? We were talking about what we liked, what was effective. Uh, what did they do that could have been better? I had my sophomores essentially coaching public speakers for TEDx, seeing what could work and what doesn't work. You can do the same for plays, watching film clips I mentioned, simply watching each other, learning from each other and what works. Um, commencement addresses as I mentioned. We've even done some scholarship contests. There's um, one uh, through the uh, Rotary Club, I think has one, um, Ki um, Kiwanis. There, just find those oratory competitions, get your kids involved, finding different speaking styles and different competition. But by all means, don't copy them. Emulating and a 
assimilating is different from straight up stealing what they do. Uh, we see this in Interp a lot, where kids will watch the drama or the humor champions uh, at nationals, and then word for word, I mean, tone for tone, steal what they saw. Everything a kid does should be their own because if we're doing this to make our kids better, we want them to feel empowered like they can do something. Um, just letting them rip off what somebody else is doing is not empowering. We're just using them as an ends to a goal. Uh, they need to learn how to write their own speech. Again, when I have kids watch The Rock, I'm not saying be Dwayne The Rock Johnson. I'm saying see how he captures his audience. What can you do that he's doing and emulate that into your own style? Uh, and, and then we watch somebody else. Like, now what does Jimmy Stewart do? And we get a blend of all these things. And in time, the kids tell me the speakers they like, and they start to bring all that together to create their own persona and speaking style. Uh, again, I'm sorry for the rush there at the end. This is typically a one-hour presentation for me. I cut a ton of stuff out, and even now I fear I'm rushing. Uh, I really do hope you'll get a hold of me. Um, you can visit us on the website. Um, this is my personal email. Um, you can also do cchinoweth at ihsfa.org. That's my email that's on the website. Um, but you can also email me personally. If you ever want other resources, I'm happy to provide those. And that's not just for um, public speaking. That can also be for inter, if you're looking for scripts, um, new coaches. I always want you to have all the resources that are out there. So by all means, hit me up. I'm way over my time, aren't I?